All right, now stand clear, boys. That's a puncture-proof tire. W.C. Fields was at the top of his grumpy, grumbling game when he played eccentric inventor Sam Bisbee in his 1934 comedy, You're Telling Me. He'd been on stage and screen since the turn of the century, and now, 34 years later, he was finally one of the biggest names in Hollywood. But Fields was unlike any other star in Hollywood. As the chief writer on virtually all his films, he never focused on creating a likable screen persona. He never softened the edges of his rough-and-tumble vaudeville past. While screen comics of the era like Charlie Chaplin, Joey Brown, and even Laurel and Hardy reached out to their audiences for sympathy, along with their laughs, W.C. Fields seemed like he really didn't care if anyone liked him or not. It was an unusual recipe for success, and it put W.C. Fields squarely ahead of his time. It would be nearly a half century before comedians like Steve Martin, Richard Pryor, and Andy Kaufman discovered that audiences have a perverse love of comedians who alienate themselves. The more you push people away, these guys discovered, the more they want you to stick around. Want to return some money? No, I'm short. Don't brag about it. I'm only five feet eight for sound. I'm Bill Newcott, film critic for the Saturday Evening Post, and we're rediscovering W.C. Fields on Movies for the Rest of Us. This month, Kino Lorber is releasing three meticulously restored classic W.C. Fields comedies on Blu-ray disc. You're Telling Me from 1934, The Man on the Flying Trapeze from 1935, and You Can't Cheat an Honest Man from 1939. When the burglar comes in here and says, stick him up, I get friendly with him. When he sits in the chair, he releases that lever. The iron bowl comes up and smites him upon the sconce. Thus. You're Telling Me finds Fields in full glorious bluster. He plays a struggling inventor named Sam Bisbee who finds unexpected success thanks to a chance meeting with a princess. Suddenly wealthy, Sam finds himself the featured player at a country club, which is really a thinly disguised opportunity for Fields to perform a golf routine he perfected in his days as a stage performer with the Ziegfeld Follies. In fact, he'd already filmed the bit not once, but twice before. In his 1926 silent film, So's Your Old Man, and in his 1930s short talkie, The Golf Specialist. Fields was already 54 and in failing health when he made your telling me, but in this remarkable scene shot from a moving camera truck, he chases a rolling tire down a Los Angeles sidewalk. Ambrose? Yes, my dear? What are you doing in the bathroom? Um, brushing my teeth, dear. A year later, Fields starred in The Man on the Flying Trapeze, a domestic comedy about a man who wants to take his first day off from work in 25 years to go to a wrestling match. He lies to his wife and makes up an excuse at work. I won't be here. My poor mother-in-law died three days ago. I'm attending her funeral this afternoon. It must be hard to lose your mother-in-law. Yes, it is. It's very hard. It's almost impossible. It's a and wouldn't you know it, near the end of the film, he finds another reason to chase after a rolling tire. Catfrey, Catfrey! Fields was never reluctant to recycle old comedy bits. His very first film, 1915's The Pool Shark, drew on a vaudeville act he'd perfected years earlier. A decade later, he landed his first feature role, starring in Sally of the Sawdust, directed by the legendary D.W. Griffith. It's a screen version of a Broadway musical that Fields had co-written and starred in, and although the film is steeped in Griffith's trademark sentiment, Fields still manages to inject his grumpy, subversive persona into the role. Mary, you're okay. I voted for you last election five times. Fields is remembered primarily for his sly mannerisms and cutting wisecracks, but he was a gifted physical comedian as well, a skill he honed as a young man when he was recognized as one of the world's greatest jugglers. As his career took off, Fields nevertheless seemed to dare moviegoers to dislike him. For his first decade on screen, he insisted on wearing a weird, obviously fake, up-under-the-nose mustache, specifically, he said, because people hated it. The great hulking brood. You know, I've never struck a woman in my life. You haven't? Not even my own mother. Um, Have you ever had this tooth pulled before? No. In one of his four Max Sennett short films, The Dentist, he plays an utterly despicable man who's rude at home, who cheats at golf, and who abuses his patients. Yeah. 
And then, of course, there was Field's lifelong feud with children. To be fair, the kids often got the last lick in, and that was by design. I'm the most belligerent guy on screen, Field said. I was the first comic in history, so they tell me to pick fights with children. But at the same time, I'm afraid of everybody. Just a big, frightened bully. You have $50 in your bag? Yes. In his entire career, Field stepped out of his familiar character just once, to star in a prestigious 1935 MGM production of David Copperfield. He played the kind, endlessly benevolent Micawber, perhaps the sweetest character ever created by Charles Dickens. All we have is yours, Master Copperfield. Our domestic comfort, the quiet, the privacy, all in your own. After a meteoric rise in the early 1930s, Field's star began to fade, in large part because of his continuing bad health due to heavy drinking. After making 13 movies in three years, Fields disappeared from the screen entirely, physically unable to work. Hello, Mr. Fields. Hello. Uh, hello, my little chum. I was thinking of you only yesterday. No, you were? Yes, I was cleaning out the woodshed at the time. <laughs> He could still do radio, though, and that led to Field's frequent appearances with ventriloquist Edgar Bergen and his leading puppet, Charlie McCarthy. Mr. Fields, is that your nose or a new kind of flamethrower? Fields and McCarthy were a sensation. Buoyed by that success and feeling better physically, Fields returned to the screen in You Can't Cheat an Honest Man, co-starring his wooden nemesis. Are you eating a tomato or is that your nose? Oh, <laughs> very good, very good, Charles. You must come down with me after the show to the lumberyard and ride piggyback on the buzz saw. Ah, what symmetrical digits. Improbably, Fields, ravaged by alcohol, seriously overweight, was hot again. He absolutely killed it opposite Mae West and My Little Chickadee, a film the two stars co-wrote. Would you object if I avail myself of a second helping? Don't you think you're a little forward on such shut acquaintance? <laughs> Armed with that success, Fields went to Universal with a take-it-or-leave-it offer. He would have complete creative control over all his films. Fields got his control, and he delivered two of the most notable films of his career. The Bank Dick is considered by many Fields aficionados to be his most consistently funny film. It was also one of his most profitable. For his next film, Fields ventured into a surreal, almost dreamlike comedy scape unlike anything he or anyone else had ever done before. Fields plays himself, gloating over the success of his previous film, The Bank Dick. Bursting with self-confidence, he goes to the studio with a script for his next movie, a fever dream musical which involves such oddities as an airliner with a rear observation deck, a free fall chasing a bottle of booze, a romantic encounter with a princess in a Shangri-La-like village, and a face-off with a gorilla. Suffering sciatica. Last time it was pink elephants. Yeah. I'll give you a peach. Oh, thank you. Even in his twilight years, Fields fearlessly thumbs his nose at the world's expectations of a movie star. And he even anticipates Universal's reaction to his wild script. This scene's supposed to be in a saloon, but the censor cut it out. Never Give a Sucker an Even Break was not a success largely because Universal buried it in theaters around Halloween. Fields would never headline another feature film, but he gave one last, uncharacteristically reflective performance in his final movie, a little seen independent film called Song of the Open Road. W.C. Fields, Chai McCarthy, and Sammy Kay, wow! Fields plays himself, entertaining workers at an orange grove where a group of young people are working as part of the federal government's Crop Corps, a program that enlisted youngsters to pick crops while the men were away fighting World War II. Greetings and salutations, friends. By all accounts, Fields, by then gravely ill, barely made it through his minimal role, and yet, for one magical moment, he grabs a few oranges, begins to juggle them, and starts to reminisce. This used to be my racket. For one last time, W.C. Fields revives an old bit, and for one brief moment, he's once again that young man, the toast of the Ziegfeld Follies, waiting to change the world. That's my racket, but it isn't anymore. I'm Bill Newcott.
You're drunk. Yeah, and you're crazy. And I'll be sober tomorrow, and you'll be crazy for the rest of your life. What? 